seen, we've seen, seen, we've seen, seen, we've seen, seen, we've seen. What's good, everybody, and welcome back to Comic Sessions. I'm your host, Sean Thompson, and we're going to talk about some comics. We're going to have a big topic. We're going to have a very special guest. We're going to talk about next week. Um, housekeeping for this week. I've been streaming on Twitch and stuff like that a whole bunch. Um, you can check me out at twitch.tv slash snowyeastmonster. Also, right off the bat, don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you want to see more comic sessions. want to find out more about the comic industry, what's going on in the scene, what's new in comics, and all that jazz. Um, so, I think that's about it. Without further ado, let's get into what's new this week. Um, so, really quickly, before I get into what I read this week, um, I want to just quickly say that I'm going to be moving away from covering the news of the comic industry, just because I think it's been not, not as timely as it could have been. Uh, most of the time, if I'm saying it, you've probably already seen it about a week or so ago. So it maybe wasn't my smartest idea to go, I'm going to tell you the news, because eh, you've probably seen it already on Twitter, because that's faster than me. So instead, I'm going to be doing a big topic each week. So every week I want to cover... Um, sorry, I'm fiddling with the comics that I'm going to show in a second. Um, so each week I want, to, I want to cover something something kind of big. So this week, uh, the topic is going to be, when we get to it, it's um, how to get into comics for new people and stuff like that. Um, but it, my big topics will be stuff like that. Going forward, how to get into comics... Um, who's the best Robin, um, who's the best Batman villain, what's the most iconic comic for you, uh, who are some of the biggest names writing comics, drawing comics, that kind of thing. Um, I just think it's a little bit, a little bit more timely, a little bit, it's, it's more fitting for what I want to do. So, that's what we're going with. Um, so, now let's get into what's new this week. Uh, so, I read five whole comic books this week. Real slow week, you know? These are the five. Look at them. Ooh. They're sticking together a little bit. A little static. Uh, so, um, gotta get my notes. Alright, let's talk about them. Uh, we'll start with DC Comics, because there's only, there's three of them. Um, so, this week from DC, I read Batman's Grave number one. I read Detective Comics number 1013, and I read Flash number 80. Um, so, might as well start with Flash number 80, because that is the last one I said. So, its picture will be the most recent. Uh, so, uh, basically, the uh, Black Flash, which is the like embodiment of death, the Black Racer, that guy, uh, he's trying to kill off all the other forces that spawned out of that Speed Force storm stuff a while ago. Blah, blah, blah. Um... So he's going around trying to kill them off. He's already got to the um, oh, the Sage Force. Barry tried to hide the Still Force. It was all confusing. He did. They, he got to a bunch of them. Basically, it's just the Still Force that's left. Um, so Barry's trying to kind of shuttle him out of there, and then Hunter Zolomon shows up, uh, and he grabs um, what's the guy's name? Steadfast. Uh, who is the Still Forces person, and he runs away with him for a bit, um, and Barry's kind of getting fucked up by the Black Racer for a minute or two, uh, and then Barry scoops up Iris and they run away, uh, and then it turns out Barry's not, uh, his uh, powers aren't working quite right, he's not healing great, uh, he's not speed healing, um, which is kind of concerning, because... The Flash's whole thing is he's fast, so if he can't speed heal, and he can't run quite as fast, then he's kind of fucked. Um, so, uh, Wally and... So, Wally stumbles upon these scary-looking versions of the rogues in the next couple panels, which is a little odd. I wonder what's going on with them kind of thing. What are they up to? They're skulking around. They look like jacked out and Halloween-y, very timely for October. Um... And they're kind of like, do we jump in and try and stop them from doing whatever they're doing, or do we wait for the Flash? Uh, and that's where we lead their story. That's 
literally all that they're in there is just that little snippet. Um, and then we cut back to Barry and Iris, and they're looking into Hunter's backstory a little bit, and they're like, he, his dad was a murderer, then he became a detective in Private Eye, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so they're looking into it, that, and then they find uh, the gun that killed his mentor, and they're like, there's two sets of fingerprints on it. The first set was this guy's, and the second was, and then they don't say who it was, um, but next we get Wally, or not Wally, oh man, uh, we get, sorry, I keep thinking of my favorite Flash. We get Barry um, catching up to uh, Hunter, uh, somehow they kind of find him, track him down a little bit, um, and Hunter and Barry are kind of fighting a little bit, and then Hunter's like, I already have the Strength Force and the Sage Force, and I'm already faster than you, you stand no chance, he's beating up Barry and stuff like that, uh, and this is when Steadfast decides to finally use his Force, and he, the Still Force, which is the polar opposite of the Speed Force, um, so he's trying to hold Hunter's arm in there, but uh, he's just too fast, and he zooms right up to him, punches him right in the or he doesn't punch him, but he, like, grabs him and steals the Sage Force from him. Uh, and then he's like, I'm not afraid of you, come get me, death! And then you see the Black Racer coming out of nowhere, coming to kill him. Uh, and the very last panel is Barry getting impaled by the Black Racer's hands. I'll put up a picture of it, because it's fucking cool. Um, it was a cool issue. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of good stuff happened in it. Um, yeah, I don't have too, too much to say. I like the art in it. Story was good. It has been good. Um, it's been cool seeing the other forces kind of flushed out a little bit. Uh, I love seeing the Black Racer because it's just like a zombie flash in a black costume. It looks cool as shit. Um, but yeah, that is basically it for Flash 80. Now we're going to talk about Detective Comics number 1013. Um, basically, this one is all about Mr. Freeze trying to bring back Nora again. Because, obviously, that's all Mr. Freeze does. Um, so, we start with Batman beating up a guy, as he always does, going, Where is she? Who took her? Where? That kind of thing. Very, um, very Dark Knight-y. Um, then we cut, the, he beats up the guy, the guy eventually gives up uh, what's going on. And then we cut to Freeze, who's apparently using women as experiments for how he can wake up Nora, they are in tubes, and he's injecting them with stuff and trying to wake them up, blah blah blah. Uh, then Batman busts in in a dope as fuck back bat suit. It's all black and red, very Batman Beyondy, but you can tell it's kind of like a heat suit, so that it'll warm up eventually. That comes in handy later. Um, so they start. He starts trying to fight with Freeze, but Freeze like calls in the troops and uh, these zombie snow people come out of nowhere and zombie animals and they're fighting Batman and then eventually Batman falls through the ice and underwater somehow um, and he's sinking and sinking and then he gets encapsulated into this little ice thing and you think it's over for the Cape Crusader but of course it's not because comic books um, so Batman uses his heat suit that I said would come in handy later uh, to heat up the ice around him he busts out and he comes right out of the block of ice he was encased in, and then busts out through the, uh, the surface ice. Uh, and he's back on land, back in the lab. Um, but Freeze is gone. So, uh, Batman and Alfred meet up at the lab, and it, Alfred, to hide his identity, is wearing a flash mask. It's very funny. Batman goes, all the, all the masks in the cave, and that's the one you found first. Um, I had a chuckle made me laugh a lot. Um, and then we cut to Freeze again, off in a different location, just with Nora, and he injects her, and he's like, please, blah, 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 They're doing like a please wake up, please work kind of thing. Uh, and then she wakes up. Fucking Nora, Freeze's whole reason for becoming a villain has just been nullified. She woke up. Like, he can go back to, like, he can't go back to having a normal life, but like, he could go on the run again and maybe something could work. Um, so yeah, it was a really cool setup issue. I really dug it. Again, art's cool. Um, I don't have much else to say. It was a cool issue. Um, I dug it. 
Now we'll get into my favorite book of the week. Through both companies, um, my favorite book of the week that I picked up. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to pick up the Savage Shores number five. I totally forgot about it uh, because it went on hey or it went on a break for a couple months and stuff like that. There was issues, but we'll get to my favorite book of the week, and that is Batman's Grave number one. Uh, this is by Warren Ellis and Hitch. Um, it was fucking cool. It was, it was a cool detective story. So, basically, it starts with Batman just on patrol. He's going around the city, he's beating up some criminals and stuff like that, protecting the citizens of Gotham. Uh, then he's driving around in the Batmobile, and he gets a call from Alfred that's basically like, on your way back, there's these people who have been calling 911 for hours, and it's one of those nights where those calls just get put on hold really telling of the city of Gotham and stuff like that, and a really good setup. So Batman's like, oh, all right, I'll go. He gets to the apartment building, and these people are like, this dude's been missing, or we haven't seen him in months, he hasn't left, and it's starting to smell. So then Batman goes in, and he finds the dead body, of course. And then we cut to Bruce back at um, Wayne Manor with Alfred, and Alfred's having a drink or two, uh, and they're just talking. And it's a very, like real conversation of Alfred being like, you are going to die. I am going, one of these nights I'm going to find you dead. Um, and I don't know that that's okay. Sometimes you have to think of yourself, that kind of thing. Like very, he's trying to be a father, which Alfred entirely is Bruce's father. There's no question. Um, so you get some really human moments between the two of them. And then Bruce goes down into the cave to be a detective. Um, so he puts himself in the shoes of the victim. And we get this whole couple pages of just Bruce trying to think of how the victim thought, what they did, what how they were doing stuff. And he comes to the conclusion that it was probably the best friend it was the best friend that killed him. It had like that's the that's the only way that could have gone. And then we get further and he's like, Okay, well where would that guy go next? Well, what was their relationship, how do they, and all that kind of stuff, and then he has kind of a, oh my god moment, and then he's back as Batman, busting through the wall of the apartment, or busting through the door of the apartment again, going, he was my friend, he was everything, and blah blah blah, and he picks up the mattress that the, uh, the other guy had been laying on, the dead guy had been laying on, and the dude who killed him and ate half his face is under the mattress. Now, last week, I made a prediction that it was the Flamingo. I was totally wrong. I can admit that. Um, but, fuck if this wasn't cool. It was such a cool detective story. Which isn't really a big surprise from Warren Ellis' writing and stuff like that. Um, I believe he wrote Parker. Uh, but, it was so cool. It was. This is what I want out of Batman a lot of times. That I feel like we don't get anymore is that really he's the world's greatest detective i don't need to see him punch dark side in the face or try and race the flash like superman does or like all these stuff it's nice to see every once in a while but i want to see batman be the world's greatest detective and that's what i got out of this issue and that's why it's my favorite issue of the week by far um all right so now let's talk about the two marvel comics i read this week and those two are doctor doom number one and Powers of X, number six. Uh, we might as well start off with Powers of X, number six, because it confused me as all things this series did. Uh, this is not to say I didn't thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, Hickman's been killing it on this book, but I was so confused. So, we start off, I didn't take as many notes because I wanted to try and understand it. Uh, we start off with a scene we've seen before. Scene we've seen, scene we've seen, scene we've seen, scene we've seen. Uh, we start off with the scene we've seen before, uh, and that is Moira talking to Charles about what the future is. And we know that she's done this a bunch of times because she keeps coming back, and we've seen the results of the different timelines and stuff like that. Um, so, in this one, she's like, you have to be different, and I have to tell you, like, you've always tried to see the good in people. You're too nice, basically. Um, then we cut to... Uh, X-Men Cubed, which is X-Men uh, Year 1000. Um, so that's way the fuck in the future. Um, and this is with the uh, the librarian. 
and the uh, big um, godlike monster thing that's going to absorb everything into one collective consciousness. Um, and basically, he's in a preserve that I guess is for mutants, and he gets attacked by Wolverine. And they kind of have a conversation between the two of them that are is like, I knew that you'd come and that kind of thing. Um, and just the librarian talking down about mutants and stuff like that. Uh, and then Moira comes out of the woods, and she joins the conversation as well. And it's the librarian saying, I'm having second thoughts, essentially. It's him being like, well, this is what we've wanted for so long, but now I'm, I'm second guessing. If I'm not a physical being anymore, am I really anything, almost? That's kind of the conversation he's having. Um, and he wants to see, like, what's going to happen and stuff like that. So they're just talking and yelling and arguing and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, he says basically that um, basically the Sentinels and the Nimrods just bought them time until they could get to this because now they're skipping over, or until they could skip over mutants because mutants always thought were what's next. Um, and they're like, humanity was just buying time until we could merge with machines and become the dominant species anyways, and say basically the way we are, not realizing that really that's still a mutation, kind of. You're altering genetics. He doesn't even look human. He's blue. Anyways. Um, but then Wolverine kills him, just outright, after being told before, like, you be too slow. By the time you've actually conceived of it, there's no... I would have thought... Or read your... Or, uh, I would have already known what you were about to do, and that kind of thing. But nope. Wolverine just stabs this dude through a tree. It's awesome. Um, but then Moira basically... But then immediately Wolverine kind of turns to Moira and is like... And she is like, you know what we have to do. Because um, now we know what's going on. We know what's going to happen. Um, so Moira's like, yeah, you have to kill me again so I can try... We can restart this. Um... Then we jump back to her telling Charles all this, again, um, and her, again, her being like, you need to be different, basically. Um, so that's a jump back in time that's technically for, it's, this is why I get confused, because it's a jump back in time, but it's to a different timeline, so it's kind of forward, because her timeline She's now experienced her um, eighth life. Um, so now she's experiencing her ninth. So it's confusing, the timeline stuff. Again, very good and very interesting, but have to read it a couple times. Um, we then get Moira's uh, journal entries, all of them regarding either Xavier or Magneto, um, then a Geico commercial, because of course, because comics need ads. Um, then we jump forward to the, the now, um, and it's Magneto and Charles now wearing the, uh, Cerebro helmet just after the meeting where they did the trial of Sabretooth, uh, and they're popping in on Moira, and Magneto is the cutest motherfucker in this because he brings her tea, um, which is awesome. Uh, and they're having a conversation, um, and essentially it all comes down to uh, they promised to bring Destiny back, but they can't because she would get uh, Moira killed, and if Moira dies, they have to do this all, like, like everything starts again, everything they worked so hard for starts again. Um, so they can't allow uh, Moira to be killed, but they kind of say, oh, we're not actually going to bring her back, we're just going to keep stalling until we can tell them the truth, what you told us that mutants always lose. Um, and then everybody's kind of tentatively cool with that. And they walk outside, back to the party we saw in House of X number six. And it's just Charles and uh, Eric having a nice conversation. We get a kind of stoic picture of uh, Apocalypse here. But again, it's Charles and uh, Eric just kind of having a moment that these two haven't really been able to have because they have had such a different ideology. Uh, but now that they're on the same path and they were friends before, they're becoming friends again, kind of. And uh, 
basically Magneto's like, I am not ashamed of what I am, uh, let them try to stop us this time. And then Xavier steps up kind of beside him in the next panel, which is a full page splash uh, panel, and it was really good. Uh, he says, yes, let them try. And it's, it's, it's kind of alludes to the fact that the mutants are, have been united completely. All of the mutants are on the same side kind of now. Um, which is a scary thing for humans and not something I think could be dealt with easy if things start to go bad. Um, but again, not that I expected to. It seems like Xavier has gotten a little darker. Um, obviously being shown all the futures of Moira's life that she's had to experience. That kind of makes sense, but it's, it's a little unsettling at times. Um, but still also inspiring. It's, this is, again, why it's confusing. It's not just the timeline stuff, but it's very... <sighs> Something doesn't seem right to me, at least, about Xavier and how things are going about. But it's really cool because you're seeing people also become free and independent, which is really, really cool to see for the mutants. So people have been so beaten down and... No matter what they do, it can't be right because they're different. They have these scary powers and stuff like that. So it's really cool to see them getting oh, put that down over there. Uh, see them getting um, getting to be their own entity. Um, so yeah, that was Powers of X number six, and it was it was a really cool issue. Um, the last comic I'm going to talk about this week is Doctor Doom number one. Um, and now, normally I don't love comics about, uh, a villain being a hero, necessarily. Like, I mean, an act, not, not in the sense of, like, Spawn, Red Hood, Wolverine, where they're anti-heroes, they're kind of doing bad things, but it's for a greater, or Punisher, for example. Um, they're doing bad things, but with a good ideology and stuff like that. Um, I'm talking more where the villain is straight up just a villain. Like a book about Joker. Just killing people and stuff like that I wouldn't be into. Doctor Doom was nothing like that. Um, it was very much a humanizing thing to see Doom in this way, not just as a villain trying to foil things, but as trying to be the leader of a nation and stuff like that. Um, so it starts out with Doom going on an interview to talk about this black hole tech that's going up on the moon. Uh, and Dr. Doom is opposed to it because he doesn't trust Richard, Reed Richards or Tony Stark. Uh, he thinks putting a black hole this close to Earth is insanely dangerous, and I actually agree. That seems like it's a dumb idea. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just setting him up to be like this comical villain almost. Um, but then he gets done with the interview, and he's like, bring me the reporters known as Steve or something like that. Um, and we get that kind of, oh fuck, he's going to kill the reporter who tried to make him look dumb. Um, which is interesting. But then he's in his study, uh, and he's talking, or he's just sitting around, you know, writing some stuff. Um, and then Kang the Conqueror kind of pops in, uh, and they start having a conversation of, why do you, why do you keep popping in on me? What, how are we linked? Why are we entangled together? Um, and you get... A little bit of story there, they're like, maybe we're related distantly, kind of thing. And then Doom asks him how this this moon black hole thing goes, and he's like, I don't know what timeline I'm in, man. Kang, Kang has no idea where he is, so uh, he can't really provide any information there. Um, and then he poofs out. <laughs> All of a sudden, it's very much Nightcrawler, like, bamfing in and bamfing out, but uh, a little different, I guess. It's a time drop. You get it. Um, but then Dr. Doom's on his own for a little bit. Then he sees a TV report of apparent Latvian troops have destroyed this moon base thing. Um, apparent Latvian troops have destroyed this moon base thing, um, and killed like 3,000 people. And they put the flag of Latveria up to be like, no, we did it. We're from here. Um, and Doom's like, holy fuck, I'm going to be in shit now. Because uh, he knows, like, 
people are immediately going to blame him. They're not going to ask questions, nothing like that. And he is entirely right on that side because they do not ask questions. It is immediately the UN, uh, the World Security Council, um, the Avengers, all of these people calling for Doom's arrest immediately. Um, and then we get two, like, bounty hunter types that uh, break in and try and fight with Doom, and he beats the crap out of them. And then uh, he's kind of just like, no, I'm, just so you guys know, I am going to surrender. Um, yeah, it was very, very interesting to see such a human side of Doom. Because um, throughout the issue, he's just like, it's, it's kind of a long issue. I summarized it very quickly there. But he's like talking to the people in his nation and he knows all the people who work for him and he's asking about their families and stuff like that. And it's very humanizing. Um, but again, Doom fights off those, uh, those people, but he's also getting some kind of... Uh, then all the helicopters show up, sorry. Uh, and we get these two little thought bubbles on the last page that are just, the world is dot dot dot. And then dot 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 leading in, not mine. And it's, again, it's very much... It, it's Doom always works for the best interests of himself and his country. Um, and blowing up the black hole thing, though ideally may have aligned with him, uh, wasn't... He didn't see it as what's best, so he didn't do it. And it's, again, it's very much... It's cool to see Doom in a slightly different light than what we're normally shown. Um, so I really dug it. Uh, the art was cool. It was very... It, a little... Eh, I was going to say a little standard, but it's not. It's really good. Um, and yeah, that was Doctor Doom number one. And that's all the comics I read this week. Uh, next we're going to get into our big topic. Alright, so for this week's big topic, I thought it'd be good to talk about how do you get into comics? There's so many of them, it can be so daunting at times. Um, so how the heck do you start? So I decided to bring on Kristen. Uh, this is my girlfriend. Hi. Um, she just recently started reading a couple comics. She's very new to it. Um, but I thought it would be good to have her on to kind of ask whatever questions she has about how you get into comics and stuff like that and how you start reading them, like where you... Like, Detective Comics, for example, I was just talking about it, and it's at issue 1013. That's got to seem crazy to anyone on the outside of comics, right? Like Totally. Yeah. And, like, for me, that is the biggest reason why I never even attempted to dabble in comics, if you will, because it's like, oh, this issue is on number 1000. Okay, well, as being someone who loves reading novels and really in-depth stories, Do I, go back I need and to know the whole story. One? I can't just start halfway through because then I'm gonna feel like I'm missing so much information that I want to know. So it's like for me to get into it, I have to decide: a, am I gonna commit the time to jumping all the way back, trying to and even find right? like, issue it's one, and then okay, it seems really intimidating, being like cool, if I want to read about, if you read I'm going to say things Jordan. and you're not going to, I'm not going to get it right, but say I want to read Batman, okay, I'm committing to thousands of dollars potentially by going back to issue one and wanting to get all the way through. There are so many subplots or sub storylines and there's five billion different Spider-Man comic universes and... Yeah, we talked about that on like episode one, we were like, or I was talking about it and I was like... There's literally like eight or nine <laughs> Spider-Man titles that are out right now. Yeah. Right? It's definitely, a, it's tricky and it's hard to figure out <laughs> where the heck you start. Oops. <laughs> Damn it, Colleen! <laughs> Alright. Why the fuck are we? I don't know, I'm so sorry. I'm new to this! Um. Oh, we were just talking and there's like, what, eight or nine? different Spider-Man titles that are out right now. How do you pick yeah. the right one? And like, yeah. stuff like that. It's, it, I totally get that getting into comics can be super, super daunting. So, uh, I'm going to start just kind of 
saying what I would tell people when they'd come into the comic book store when I was working there, um, and they were trying to get into comics, um, I'm going to kind of take you guys through what I would tell them, and hopefully make it easier for you. I know a lot of people are trying to get into comics because of all the Marvel movies and stuff that are coming out. They want to see the origins, but then Google something, and you find out that Spider-Man has six different origins, that which one is right, which one is current, that kind of thing. Okay, so say I was a customer, we're at the comic book store, you work there, I walk in, and I say, Hi, I've never been in a comic book store before, this is my first time ever, I've never read a comic book, I want to give it a try. What do you say to that? Where do I start? Where do you recommend The first that... thing you got to find out is what kind of comics or storylines you want to read. Yeah. Be it superheroes, horror, sci-fi, fantasy, uh, slice of life, whatever. Okay. You have to know, it, basically, whatever movie genre you like, there is a comic for. Or hundreds. It's like books. So if you kind of know where you're going, it, it really helps uh, anybody working at a comic book store to kind of point you in the right direction. Okay. Um, so if you come in, say you, I know you, you like fantasy. Yeah. Right? That's your kind of jam. Yeah. Um, most comic book stores will have sections like a Chapters or an Indigo that are like, here's the fantasy books, here's the young adult. Like, they'll, they'll be sectioned off. Yeah. So it's a little easier to find your way that way. Always ask for recommendations, of course, because mm -hmm. generally people who work in comic book stores are nicer than you'd think. Um, they're not terrifying nerds slash nerds who are terrified to speak to you for the most part. I mean... Well, speaking as, like, a a semi-outsider, I guess, to the comic book world, I think a lot of people like me would maybe feel uncomfortable or awkward walking into a comic book store just because there is so much stigma out there about how there's such a tight-knit community and it's like 100%. if you don't know what you're talking about you're gonna be like made fun of or like not welcomed in and I feel like it can be like with joining any new team or activity I yeah. feel like it can be so daunting just walking in. It totally can and, and I feel like nerds and geeks get a really bad reputation for it sometimes because of the angry video gamer, right? That That's a pretty, like, or angry nerd, right? The, the people who are gatekeeping and trying to, or seem like they're trying to be like, this is for us, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you don't read this, you're not a real fan. And that's such a small percentage of the population. Yeah, like, that's like, not the norm. That's no, not... that's the vocal minority talking. Don't listen to them. They're trash trolls on Reddit and stuff like that. Okay. Nothing they say matters. <laughs> um, but... Yeah, most, most people who read comics are generally pretty cool. Um, but it's... Say you were looking for a fantasy book. Uh, if you're just starting out, I recommend trade paperbacks. Um, sounds like a really fancy name, but <laughs> literally all it is is something like this. This is a copy of Batman Hush. Um, and all a trade paperback is is the entirety of a storyline from... Uh, a bunch of single issues bound into one book. It's a graphic novel. Graphic novel, trade paperback, they're all the same thing. They're just bound single issues. So it's a little less daunting and it catches yeah. you up a little faster, yeah. a little cheaper. You don't have to try and track down issue 1 to 10 of something that you might not be able to find as easy. Mm -hmm. Generally trade paperbacks are reprinted fairly frequently. Um, it's a lot easier to find a complete storyline you can typically find the start of something a lot easier in trade form. But if yeah. you... Yeah. It, trades are generally the way to go when you start off. Well, the first one I ever read was a trade. Yeah. Like that... Um, you can show me. I'll show, I'll show you. Say. I brought it. Fables. Um, I loved this one. Sean recommended it to me as my first... I mean, we Girl. live together. We spend 90% of our time together. And... 90% of his time I spent <laughs> reading comics or playing video games, etc. So yeah. I was like, okay, let me give it a try. Just, I was curious. Yeah. I want to know. You, you love it so much, and I'd like to be able to actually hold a decent conversation when uh, you want to bring that topic up. So yeah. I thought I'd give it a try, and this was actually such a good recommendation as a yeah. first one. Well, you were reading, or you were watching Once Upon a Time. That's yeah. Funny. That's the other thing. Make sure you tell. If you're asking for a recommendation in a comic book store or trying to Google like what you should start off reading, stuff like that, 
looking for iconic storylines isn't necessarily the best way to go. Yeah. Because typically they'll either be really deep in the comic already and they're, you, you're kind of expected to know some of the lore and this and that and the next thing. Or um, they're just a little trickier, the blocking's harder and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I find, at least if somebody tells me like, oh, I like Star Wars and like... I don't know, Battlestar Galactica, <laughs> and this, or thing. I like I scary kind of, things, or I like yeah. funny things, or, tell, or give them, give somebody something to work with, give them some yeah. anecdotal, I'm watching this show and really digging it, is there anything kind of like it in comics, that's why Once Upon a Time is very similar to Fables, you get these fairy tale people encroaching on the real world, mm -hmm. and how, did, how would that uh, interaction go, and stuff like that, so that's where uh, I recommend something like that, um, but it's, it's really, it, comics are a really personal thing. Mm -hmm. For as much as they are an art for, a public art form, you can get really attached to characters. That's why fandoms are so rabid and why they can seem a little daunting yeah. to get into. It's just because they feel very attached to the characters. Mm -hmm. Well, and something that you said to me this past week that really kind of was the turning point for me being able to even tr like pick up an actual comic book and read it, and even with like the manga and everything, was because I, I was trying to read one and I said, or I wanted to read one and I said to him like, my issue is I get so confused by the bubbles and the blocks and there's so many things going on and I'm like, I want to look at the pictures, I want to read the text, where do I go when there's multiple text bubbles happening in one block? And when you explain it to me, like, it's a movie, like, parts are flashbacks, parts are inner thoughts, parts are the actual yeah. speech that the character is saying, that was, like, the switch flipped on for me. That was such a, a good way to describe it. It made it so much easier for me to start to then recognize, oh, this person's talking, but then it's showing me also what their inner thoughts are. Because my biggest complaint, or I guess the biggest barrier stand that was standing in my way between even trying any comic related books was the fact that as someone who loves reading novels I I love how precisely in depth and detailed and all the narrative and background story that you get from a novel but when you talked about it think of it like a movie yeah. then it made me realize you can actually get more in depth with exactly. them as well it's not just a surface the, level the easiest way to think about comics is a single issue is an episode of a TV show. A whole storyline is either a movie or uh, a whole season of that show. And the whole run is that show's whole run. Yeah. Right? Like it, basically comics are written as scripts. Yeah. They're written traditionally as like, if you Google a, a comic script right now, it, you'll see it's very, very similar to a movie or TV script. Because it's so-and-so says this, and then it's the description of what's going on in the scene for the artist to draw. Um, so it that's kind of what clicked for me when I started reading comics, is, oh, these are, these are TV shows. This is a little slice of a bigger picture. Yeah. Um, but, again, there, there are plenty of ways to get into comics. If you want to get started right now, you don't want to bother with all the catch-up, you've done your Googling and stuff like that, uh, then... I don't recommend jumping into the middle of a storyline because that can get really confusing mm -hmm. and you can get lost very, very quickly. Um, because you might, say, say that issue of Flash that I was talking about, if you hadn't read what was going on before it and you jump into it, you're going to be sitting there going, what the fuck's going on? I don't understand. It's the middle of a storyline. There's a zombie Flash type character chasing after Flash. There's another guy in a very similar suit also chasing Flash, but he's mean. Yeah. And then there's Wally West and another... Like, it's it gets all muddled because you jumped in right in the middle. It's like jumping in the middle of a, of a TV series and not knowing any of the characters, not knowing what the plot is going in kind of thing. Um, so it can get very confusing. Um, but there are new issue ones all the time. Um, the plot is a good example. Something is Killing the Children is another good example. I know both of these are horror books. Uh, they're just the first just two I seasonal. grabbed. It's, it's what we've been yeah. getting into this season. <laughs> well, they're just the first season. two I grabbed. Oh. Yeah. Um, but there are new number ones all the time. So you can kind of check out uh, previousworld.com. 
Uh, it'll tell you what's coming out for the next month or two or something like that. Um, so you can kind of plan on when a number one is going to hit if you want to start from a number one. If not, you can also look up when a storyline is going to end. Normally, storylines are about... Like, a story arc is normally, like, between three and ten issues long, I want to say. Ten is pretty long. Twelve is, like, the max a story typically is. Um, Batman's Grave is going to be twelve issues. Um, but you get these... You get kind of deadlines, and they're the wraps on the seasons, basically, right? So you get... That story's covered, all right, moving on. You might have to Google a little bit to see what happened in that last one, because it'll carry over. But the start of a new story arc is a perfect jumping on point for most people. Mm -hmm. um, and it just makes it a little less daunting, too. Like, as much as I would absolutely love to go back to the beginning and read Wonder Woman or Thor, I know that I'm going to have to get used to things before I commit to jumping all the way back. And, and yeah. you can always pick up with a new, like, the newest Wonder Woman storyline. I don't have to go all the exactly. way back to the original one. Um, and, I don't know, I just find it's important to, like, for me, I, I love reading longer novels, like I said. So, reading a manga or a trade paperback... I prefer because it's something longer. It's I don't just finish it sitting in, in one go. Whereas if you're someone who needs like that sense of completion or that sense of, oh, I, I, I made it through, then start with a single start issue single comic issues. because then it's something you can sit through in one night and get through and you'll feel that sense of accomplishment. Like, oh, I got through my first comic book. Single you know? issues are incredibly <laughs> dangerous though. They're the most addicting fucking thing possible. It's like, trying to binge watch it, it's like television before Netflix. You'd sit there, and you'd finish the episode, and you'd be like, oh man, I can't wait till next week, except single issues are normally once a month. So you sit there going, what the fuck's gonna happen to Batman? <laughs> For a month, sitting there thinking, and then there's, there's comics like Doomsday Clock. Did I tell you what happened with Doomsday Clock? It's like the second to last issue, and it's been delayed for like three months. I have no idea. Yeah. I don't even remember what happened. I've been sitting here waiting for it to come out. Um, so I have to go back and read them all again. Yeah. So single issues are dangerous. Fair warning. Caution. Um, but they are great for that little hit of a story every, every week. And once you get... Trades are normally trailing uh, single issues a little bit. Um, they don't get... The trade doesn't come out the same day the last issue of that series comes out. That's just not how it works. Um, so, if you're reading trades, you will always be slightly behind the single issue readers. Um, but that doesn't, it doesn't matter. If you're reading something because you love it, that doesn't matter. Yeah, the I only think reason the... it matters is if you're doing something like me and you're trying to talk about comics every single week. <laughs> Yeah, but as someone new, sticking with the theme, as mm -hmm. someone new breaking into it, it doesn't matter how quickly you get through it or no, how no. long it takes, um, or if you read an old one versus a new one. No, reading old comics is great. I think as long as you give it a try and you open your mind to trying something new and realizing it's going to be different than if you're just used to reading books like I was, it is very different. Um, but, that, but different isn't bad. It's cool. Yeah. Stop. Okay, so, um, I guess I'll give you guys quickly just a, a couple recommendations that are really quick, um, just to kind of say these are comics that I've really enjoyed that I find people tend to enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, one that I don't have here, but I do have buried in a long <laughs> box somewhere, is Court of Owls Volume 1. Uh, it's by Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo. Uh, it's a more recent Batman story, but it's not in the current continuity it's just a really interesting story and it's good um practice for um for getting to know how the bubbles and stuff like that works um but i'll go through a couple superhero ones both of them are batman um i can give other suggestions in the description below as well for some other like something from marvel something not batman from yeah. dc that kind of thing um, also non-trades like all of yeah. these are trades just because it, They're a great way to get started. Yeah, but uh, I'll throw some some single issues and stuff like that in, in the description below. Uh, that way, if you guys are interested, you can just click on down and you'll be able to see 
a bunch of recommendations that I have for where you can jump on and what you can read. Um, but the two Batman recommendations I have are Under the Red Hood and Batman Hush. Um, and the reason I like both of these, besides the beautiful artwork and great storyline, is Under the Red Hood, basically all the backstory you need to know is um, nothing. You don't need backstory for this one. It, it'll tell you any backstory you need in the volume, which is great, especially if you're jumping on. Yeah. Um, plus, it was made into a DC animated movie. So if you've seen the movie and you liked it, give the comic a try. It'll help you kind of keep up with how the story's supposed to move and stuff like that. Uh, and Hush, I always recommend um, because Jim Lee's art in it is absolutely gorgeous. Um, uh, I'll throw up some pictures of what the art looks like, but it's fucking great. Um, and again, it gives you all the backstory you need to know. It introduces you to a bit wider of the characters. You get Poison Ivy, you get Killer Croc. Catwoman, Batman, Superman, um, and you also get introduced to a newer, not super new anymore, but a newer villain, Hush. So you get a character that's not a, inside the normal kind of range of Batman villains mm -hmm. you see all the time, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Um, so those are the two superhero-y ones that I'll recommend verbally, but again, in, check the description uh, on YouTube or in the, uh, the podcast version and I'll, I'll throw up a bunch more. For superhero ones... Um, so I have a spooky book, uh, recommendation, and that's Hellboy Seed of Destruction. Um, I grabbed the wrong Hellboy book here. Because <laughs> I, I have all of them. Twice. Um, so, uh, but Hellboy Seeds of Destruction is really cool because Mike Magnolia's art is, is really, it's really interesting. It's very, um, you get these really, really dark blacks, and then these splashes of very vibrant crimson and greens and blues and stuff like that. It's very interesting, and the art really draws me in, and it's a different art style than you typically think of when you think of comics. Most people think of comics and they think, like, dude who's shaped like a triangle, and, like, there's, you have a, most people have a judgment in their head. I know I do. Like, if someone says comic book art, I, I immediately picture something. Um, so this gives you a bit of a different perspective and shows you that comics can go a really, really different direction. Um, something that makes it really good for someone who's not used to reading comics is I like how linear and easy to follow the panels are. Yeah. Like, it, it, it doesn't jump all over the place and get all crazy. Yeah. It's just a nice, simple flow. <laughs> Um, another spooky one that's really good, but a really weird art style, so I would say jump into it maybe after you've read a comic or two, um, would be Witches, which is, uh, Witches, Witches. Um, I've done that a couple times on this episode already, like since since. Uh, anyways, uh, Witches, uh, which is a, uh, really, um, it's a dark book. It's really, really dark. Um, but... The way Jock does the art in it is you get these streaks. It's very abstract almost in how the, the coloring is done. So you get this very almost muted tone main kind of image of what the what's going on in the picture. And then to give it almost a surrealism feel, there's stretches of color and stuff like that to give it that kind of psychological horror aspect to it and kind of bring the, the book a little more to life. So clearly, Sean loves the artwork of comics. I do. That's, that's why I love always comics. The first thing he mentions when talking about a comic and making recommendations is, "Oh, the, the art in this one. You gotta, you gotta see it." Because the art is what makes it a comic, in my opinion. The writing could be done in a book, right? The way the scripts are written, with a few tweaks, you could probably make it a novel. Mm -hmm but it's the art that brings it alive and makes it a comic, right? And that's why I always gravitate towards the art. Um, now i got two sci-fi books that I'm going to recommend. Um, they're both Image comics. Uh, Image is great for new people starting out into comics because most of their volume ones, so their trade paperbacks that are the first storyline of uh, a comic series, typically are much cheaper priced than... Mm -hmm. Um, 
anyone else. So like, they used to be every volume one was eleven ninety nine, whereas other comic book studios were selling any comic is at least eighteen to twenty dollars. They moved up a little bit. I think they're like fourteen or sixteen each now, just because prices move and ink is expensive and you gotta pay people good. Um, but Image is great. I love Image Comics. Um, and they're especially good for sci-fi and horror and fantasy stuff. So, uh, the two sci-fi books I'm recommending are East of West and Saga. Um, East of West is the most mashed up weird book. Uh, maybe not the most weird book I've ever read. But it's this weird hodgepodge of ideas. So, it's a sci-fi environment. So... There's all sorts of crazy tech, you're on different planets, stuff like that. It's set in the Old West, kind of how Firefly was kind of set in the Old West, so you get gunslingers and um, stuff like that. And the main characters are the four horsemen of the apocalypse, with death being the one you're focusing on. So it's really, it sounds like a bunch of things that should not work together does and it's great uh, it's um it's a hickman book who's been writing house of x and powers of x um he's one of the kind of bigger names in comics i'm gonna do a whole episode on the big names in comics uh probably in a couple weeks so don't worry i'll cover them all or if not all that would be a lot of people but i'll cover some of the ones that i really dig um but we'll move on to saga really quickly and saga is a really cool book it's very, I'm just going to jump into what it's about, because I don't, it's, again, it's a little weird, but it's less weird than East of West. Um, and it's basically about these two characters. Each of them are a different alien species, but they're very humanoid. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, their two species are, or, yeah, species are at war. Uh, they have this big galactic war thing. But these two warriors are in love, Aww, and they have a baby. Look, can you see? Aww. That's not them, but okay. Yes, it is. Oh, that that one is. I thought you were pointing at that one. No, these guys, not the yellow. These guys right here. Look at that. Aww. It's not gonna focus. No, it's okay. keep focusing on me. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're in love, and they have a kid. And it's basically their story on the run because that makes them war criminals. So they have to go on the run and it's them trying to raise their kid. And it's all written as like, I think it's all from the kid's perspective, if I recall correctly. So it's her retelling the story of her parents, kind of. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah. it's. This is the next one I'm going to try reading. Yeah, as a... it, it's really, really good. Yeah. And it's one that everybody who reads falls in love with. Um... I am kind of the exception, but that's because I like my spooky books more than I like my sci-fi yeah. books. Um, it's not a knock. You're not a big saga. slice of life person. It's not slice of life, but it's like sci-fi slice of life. It's not right? slice of life. -y. It's war. Like they're oh, on the okay, run, okay. kind of. It's it's a little like it's slice of lifey in that you get pictures of how their life is, but it is but not, it is not a slice of life. You're, you're not reading Archie. Just get in. But you could read Archie, because Archie is also a very good uh, comic right now, um, from Archie Comics. Um, but yeah, those are just a couple recommendations. Again, I'll throw some more down in the description, just so that you guys can check those out later. Um, but yeah, do you have any more questions about how to get started in comics or anything like that? Did we cover everything? We definitely didn't cover everything, but I think we talked about the main things. At least the main hurdles that I have always felt or thought of Fair I enough. guess I don't know um but comment below or if you're listening to the podcast version uh on social media tweet me yeah at sean underscore thompson just tweet at me and yeah. if you have questions I'd be more than happy to help if I can mm -hmm. um so yeah all right thanks Great. for having me yeah thanks for coming <laughs> um I'll just quickly go through what comics I'm uh what comics I'm reading next week really quick bye guys
right, so now that we're through the big topic, uh, let me just quickly run through what I am reading next week. Uh, so, from DC Comics, I am reading Aquaman number 53, Batman number 81, Flash Forward number 2, and Superman Smashes the Clan number 1. Can't wait for that book. It's going to be so cool. Superman's going to kick the shit out of some uh, KKK guys. It's going to be great. Um, from Marvel Comics, I am reading X-Men number one. This is coming straight out of House of X and Powers of X. Um, and it looks super, super good, so I'm excited for that. Uh, and I'm also reading Something is Killing the Children number two. I loved issue one of this. It was such a great, great book. Uh, it's by James Tywin the fourth. IV. Fourth. Yes. Ha-ha! <laughs> Roman numerals. Um, and it was super cool. Uh, it's definitely a book for Halloween. A little spookier. Um, you get monsters. There's this badass chick running through the forest killing it. Um, yeah, it, issue one was really cool, and I can't wait for issue two to come out next week. Um, and that's it. Uh, I might pick up one or two other things just kind of sporadically. I tend to do that every once in a while. I just kind of go, oh, this looks kind of good, and I pick something off the shelf. Um, but yeah, those are the the six that I plan on reading. Uh, I'll throw them in the description below, and I'll tweet them out and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, that's everything for this week. Thank you so, so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I'll catch you next week. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell if you want to see more from me, Sean Thompson, talking about comics and stuff like that. And don't forget to leave a comment down below. Thanks so much.